So I'm uh, really excited to welcome to School Sucks Podcast for the first time as a guest, Jeff Berwick. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Good, Brett. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, I'm excited about the second installment of our series here, The Freedom of Success. I started with uh, Joby Weeks about uh, a month ago. And this is really a series where I was hoping to talk to my young audience or the young people in my audience about the the attributes of success things like taking risk facing failure vision passion purpose focus flexibility curiosity open-mindedness etc um through the biographies of people who are you know successful and financially independent whether they're libertarian or not i figured i would start with people who are like-minded that would make the interviews go a little bit more smoothly and prevent the eruption of uh, debates that would throw us off track. So, um, you know, the, I, a question that I said to my audience, I would ask everybody, and I forgot to ask Joby, but it's a nice warm-up softball for us. Jeff Berwick, successful because of school or in spite of it? <laughs> oh, definitely in spite of it. Um, uh, when I was younger, um, I kind of enjoyed school, I think. I think a lot of kids don't mind it until they're maybe around... 11 or 12, I think things really start to change, uh, not only <laughs> in many ways, but also in your own body around that point in time. You also start to become more aware of what's going on. And so I, I think I enjoyed, you know, I, I have kids right now. I have a seven and nine year old and uh, I keep telling them they don't have to go to school if they don't want to, but they really love it. They go to a Montessori school here in Acapulco and it's mostly just games and they, they learn through games and they come home and they're so excited every day. And I'm like, that's great. Uh, but uh, I, I remember for me personally uh, that uh, around the age of 12, um, I started to just start to think, what, this is useless, this is a waste of my time. I know how to read now, which actually didn't take very long at all. Uh, and, and you don't need to go to school to read either, and especially in today's day and age with texting and all that sort of thing. Kids very quickly learn that because it's a necess necessity. Um, and I wasn't interested in math and that sort of stuff. So around grade, I think, seven or, or around that age, I remember going to biology class and physics class and social studies class, which I knew actually was mostly incorrect information that was highly propagandized about. I, was, I grew up in Canada, so it was always Canada is the greatest because of this and that and I was like this is sounds like total propaganda I, I'm not getting the whole story here um, so I actually stopped going uh, to school quite a bit and I just sit in my basement on my computer and this is back in like 1981 uh, so the computer had just come out so Apple II plus computer for your younger listeners they probably have never even heard of it it's pretty embarrassing how bad it was but uh, I was just super into computers and so I generally stopped going for the most part, but then the principal would start calling the house and he would say, hey, you know, your son isn't here very often. And my mom would be surprised because I, I didn't really let her know that I was just downstairs all the time. I'd, I'd actually go upstairs in the morning around eight in the morning, take my shoes and bring them down to my bedroom. And she would just check to see my shoes were gone. And if they were gone, she figured I went to school. And this went on for quite a while. And then finally, I, my mom uh, figured out that I was really not going at all. And she said, you know, you have to go to school. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know why or, or I didn't understand, but I knew my, it was important to my mom. So I, I did deal with her. I said, listen, um, I can tell most of the teachers at the school are way stupider than me. I can actually just tell that already. Uh, they're, they're morons. Uh, not all of them, of course, but almost all of them. Uh, I'd always be like criticizing things they'd be doing, and then they'd get mad at me for pointing out their errors. and, and um, I did a deal with my mom and I said, I'll just go for the tests. And if I pass the tests and I get my diploma, my badge of obedience, uh, then uh, everything's good, right? And she's like, okay, as long as you get your badge of obedience, your high school diploma. And so that's what I did. I'd mostly just uh, go for the tests. I'd read the textbook the night before or the morning of, uh, because a lot of it wasn't all that difficult. Um, I, I essentially got 50% in almost every class I was in because I knew that's what I needed to pass. Um, and so, yeah, no, my uh, uh, experience with school was that it was a massive hindrance to what I wanted to do, which was to learn uh, at that moment in time mostly about computers. And of course, back then, 1980s, uh, there was no computer classes or anything like that. And so I was just, I just considered it a massive hindrance. And then the funny part is that after high school, 
Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting there again, and I'm like, okay, I'm free. Now I can go and learn what I want and do what I want. I can go work. I can make some money. And then my mom goes, no, you have to go to college. And I'm like, what? And uh, I, I didn't even uh, have the grades to get into any university. So she said, you can get into community college. I'm like, why? And she's like, well, you, this is how it is. You have to do that to get a job. I'm like, I don't want a job. I want to start my own businesses and stuff. And besides any job I want, I'm sure I can just go talk to them and tell them, uh, you know, here's what I'm good at and get the job, like computer sort of related stuff. And uh, she goes, no, you have to. So she made me pick a uh, course. And uh, uh, so the only thing I saw in the, in the whole community college that interested me at all was something called uh, uh, mass media and advertising. Uh, so something about uh, media and advertising interested me. And I didn't know why, but I, I said, okay, I'll go to this one. So I went to it. And for the first few months, uh, they actually had like a computer. They were t teaching us how to do media over an old Macintosh computer at the time. This is 1989 now. And uh, I was constantly telling the teachers they didn't know what they were doing because they didn't. And these teachers really thought they were like the most amazing people on earth. They, you know, whoa, I, I'm, I'm the genius of media because I did this once in the 1960s. And uh, they actually kicked me out. And the class they kicked me out of was called Mass Media 101 uh, because I was constantly telling them that they were idiots. <laughs> and uh, uh, 10 years to the day, so 1998, uh, 1999, uh, I was running a media company worth $240 million. Um, so it just goes to show that no, there was, schooling was nothing but a hindrance and an irritant uh, to me my entire life. Right, right. Yeah, I was talking to uh, this guy, Drew Sample, last night. He has a podcast called The Sample Hour, and he's like in his mid to late 20s. And, you know, we were sharing some of our school stories, and I think. Uh, you and I were lucky enough that we are at an age where if we were doing these things in school, even like five, ten years later, uh, we would have been drugged and arrested, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So we just made it in like uh, the, sa the safer uh, time for uh, public school in the United States. So I want to ask you this, and I know a little bit about uh, your story uh, as a young man, but computers, kind of a kind of a retreat for you? from maybe not just the academic life, but maybe the social a little bit as well? Yes, uh, absolutely. I was, uh, I was, when I was really young, I was very outgoing, but something happened around the time uh, puberty hit, and I became incredibly shy. And uh, the computers didn't help, uh, but it was, a, it was a place for me to go where I felt like I could uh, explore and, uh, and do things that I couldn't do in real life for whatever reason. And it was actually a good and a bad thing because it was bad because I didn't learn social skills until I was well into my 20s because I was always on my computer. Um, but it was good because I, I learned so much uh, being on the computer. So this is way before the internet. They, were, they used to be called bulletin board systems. You used to actually just call someone's house, and only one person could log on to like what was a website at the time. At a time, and if you called up a guy's house and the phone line was busy, then you have to wait till that person gets off. It was it was really cr quite, and the the, the modem speeds. Uh, we're like 300 baud or 1200 baud. Uh, that's like uh, 0.3 kilobits per second, uh, about 1,000 times slower than, than what we have today or more. Uh, it literally was so slow to download a one megabit file would take most of the day. And that's all you could really store on your computer at the time anyway, because the, there was no hard drive. So you just have these floppy disks, which had 1.4 megabits on them. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty, pretty archaic, but um, so yeah, it was a good and a bad thing for me uh, that uh, that I was on computers all the time back then. Uh, but uh, it uh, to me it was it was it was fascinating and interesting. That's what I was interested in, and and that's uh, I'm still to this day very interested in computers, and and not so much uh, as programming as much anymore, but just uh, the way that we can use them, like how we're using them right now, talking. Uh, you know, in high quality video face to face from I'm here in Mexico, you're up in the freeish state up north and and we can talk like this. And I, I love all the uses and the advances of the technology. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the reasons why I asked about your shyness, I actually wanted to move to um, a question. I, I put this in our Facebook group and I said, do people have questions for Jeff Berwick? And I got an interesting one from a listener named Sarah. Um, when I heard you say one time when you've got a problem or you've got an obstacle and you don't know what to do, sometimes you need to do the most extreme thing. So there you are, the shy young man, and you, in addition to retreating into the world of computers, you also kind of jumped out 
<laughs> into the world of hip hop, which I, when I first heard this story, I was fascinated. And unfortunately, there just wasn't enough information available about this. You know, there's hardly anything online. So what can you, what can you tell us about Jeff Berwick, the rapper? <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of a funny story. So this again goes back to the 1980s um, and uh, 1985, um, and uh, the uh, rap had just come out, hip hop. Uh, it was Grandmaster Flash, and then Run DMC, and things like that. And I, I just loved it. Uh, something about the music really spoke to me. And I, at, the, at the time, I was really into heavy metal because uh, that was sort of the hip thing at the time. Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, ACDC. Um, and I still like a lot of those groups, but uh, then hip hop came out and there's something so raw about it and how they spoke all these messages. And I didn't know at the time I was a, fr a freedom lover, uh, but a lot of what those rappers were saying, especially NWA and Public Enemy and all that, uh, really resonated with me. So I just loved it. And so I was sitting there and I, I started downloading, this is like I said, around 1986, 80, uh, around 1985, 86, and then into 87, then the computers were getting a little bit better. and. Um, I started to realize you could download a lot of, you know, very, very, compared to what we have today, very uh, uh, archaic sort of software to make music. Um, and there was things like beat boxes and things like that, which were actually hardware at the time. And I found it wasn't that hard to make rap music. So I started just playing with it and I enjoyed it. And I thought, man, this sucks because I'm like 18 years old and I'm so shy at this moment in time that I can't even go and talk to anybody in public. I was just head down just incredibly shy because I had sort of spent uh, most of my uh, younger years, my teen years, just in on my computer. And I thought, you know, my life is not going to go very well if I can't even speak to anybody in public, no matter how much I can do on a computer. It's just because at that moment in time, of course, during this entire period, I had become incredibly interested in females uh, because right. I had hit puberty and all that. And uh, I was looking at them and looking at them on my computer and I was like, oh my God, I like this so much, but how am I going to even get to even talk to one because I can't. So I thought, I always do this and this is something I did once again. I love to always do the most extreme thing possible to get myself out of a problem that I can't fix. Uh, so in this particular case, I was incredibly shy. So I thought, what's the most extreme thing I could possibly do to make myself, like force myself to change? And I thought, well, I love rap. Uh, I'll become a rapper. So I started, I not only made the music, but I also started rapping. And uh, by the way, it wasn't very good. But uh, for, for 1988, it wasn't too bad at all. Um, and actually, uh, I, I became fairly popular in the area where I was from. It was played at the local clubs. So I'd go out to the clubs and people would be all like, you know, dancing to, to my tracks. And I was actually set to open for MC Hammer in 1989 in a place called Edmonton, which is where I'm from in Canada. Uh, but he actually ended up canceling that concert. But I was about to, you know, open in front of 15,000 people uh, doing this rap. And, um, but then I heard about, uh, I was listening to all the other rappers, and especially in Canada where I was from, because Canada has this government regulation that you have to play a certain amount of Canadian music on the radio. It's really ridiculous, and Canada's just ridiculous with so many of those things. And they still have that today. So that's why you only hear like Brian Adams and Alanis Morissette on the radio just looped all day <laughs> on, in right. Canada. Uh, so, so I was kind of like thinking, well, you know, if I, if I want to get a start, I'm going to have to compete with the other Canadian artists who are out there right now. And there was a bunch of uh, black or dark skinned rappers who were really good. Uh, people that you've probably never heard of. Uh, people like, um, oh, I forget his name off the top of my head. Uh, anyway, you've never heard of him. And, uh, and then I thought, well, you know, I, I have to make a niche for myself. So who's the best white rapper in, in Canada? And the, the best one, and not many people know this, was Tom Green, who's yeah. the actor now. And he had a group called uh, Organized Rhyme, which is a pretty cool name. Uh, and uh, they had the, a track called Check the OR. Check the OR, you like it so far? You can actually look it up. They actually just remixed it recently, and it's really good. And so I was listening to that, and I'm like, oh, Tom Green kicks my butt, you know, like... Um, I'm never even going to beat Tom Green, much less, you know, you know, Vanilla Ice or whoever else, uh, any other white rapper I want to compete with. And so I quit rapping at that moment in time. And uh, but, I, you know, I'd, through that, I actually had become less shy. 
And then I went on to produce music for other people because that was what I started to get better at was the, all through the computer. I do everything through computers because that's what my base was. Uh, I actually didn't know how to play any instrument whatsoever, but I did so many songs that you wouldn't believe that I had no idea how to make music with like my own hands. I could do it all through um, computers and samples and mixing samples and all that kind of stuff. It's sort of like today. Uh, a lot of the people that you hear on the radio today, they're not very good artists at anything, but they can really change it all with all the computers in the studio. Uh, and so um, through all that I just became less shy and then it just went on and on to the point where today finally at 43 years old I'm not shy whatsoever <laughs> I can talk to anybody but it took it took all that time and actually even just public speaking and things like that uh, when I first started speaking what I'm doing today with the dollar vigilante and things like that it was very uncomfortable uh, to be speaking in front of hundreds or thousands of people uh, I used to eat, drink uh, a few glasses of wine or, or whatever before to get comfortable but I, I enjoyed that as well because I'm now at the point where I'm totally comfortable speaking in any situation. Uh, it took only uh, 43 years but uh, but the first thing I did like I said was start rapping when I was uh, 18 and that helped uh, to get me to just get out there in public. Yeah absolutely so let me let me ask you this did this when facing an obstacle do the most extreme thing? Uh, did it ever backfire? Did you did you continue on uh, with that uh, with that idea and did it ever not work out? Well, it depends on how you look at things. Because uh, another example would be that I decided to travel the world by sailboat once, and I I had never sailed before, and I just pushed off and almost sank it twice the first night, uh, but I kept going for about a year, and I made it to El Salvador, uh, and then I sank it. But I was actually a pretty good sailor at that point because it had been a year. So it's all how you look at it. Some people will look at that and go, oh, look, he took a chance and he sunk a sailboat. But I look at it as that was an incredible experience uh, that uh, actually really changed my life uh, in many ways because it taught me, um, for, for one thing, I was living on the boat. I had moved onto the boat. Everything I owned was on the boat, and it sank. And so when I went to the shore in El Salvador, I had to pretty much, you know, I was just in my, my a pair of shorts. That's all I had, and I had managed to put my uh, credit card into my pocket. And so I just uh, lived uh, completely free from that point on for a number of years. So it's all how you look at things. So many people look at, it's all perspective. Uh, many, what I say whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's, you know, I, I didn't make that saying up. I think people have said that before. And it's, it's, it's completely true. And I think uh, risk taking uh, done properly. Now, a lot of people say I'm a huge risk taker. I don't see it that way. For example, with the sailboat, I've always said, you know, the worst thing that happens is the boat sinks, then I'm in water. Well, I've got life jackets, I've got rafts, I've got SOS mayday calls I can make. It's not that dangerous. Uh, it's all how people think about risk. Um, uh, I don't see myself as a massive risk taker. If every Everything I've ever done, including rapping and all that, I was just trying things. and. And uh, I didn't get hurt. I, it wasn't like I, I couldn't rap well and then I got killed. <laughs> it, was, it was like, no, I just, I just stopped rapping and then I tried something else. Um, you know, people, uh, what I find in the world today a lot is people are so much less risk takers than at any time in human history. If you just look back at anyone before the 1900s or even in the early 1900s and what they did, uh, people like the old people who used to sail around the world when they thought the world was flat and, um, you know, they would took massive risks and they'd end up getting scurvy and all kinds of things or they'd sail all the way over from Europe, all the way over here. Uh, if they survived that, and they didn't even know where here was, you know, these are the first explorers, uh, they'd get to a place like this and then all the natives would try to kill them. And then, you know, and then they'll survive that and they'll end up taking over, which actually is kind of, I don't like how they did it, but they did anyway. Um, then you talk to people today and they're like, oh, I don't know if I was going to move to Mexico, I don't know if I have enough money because, you know, I've only got a thousand dollars and the flight's like three hundred dollars and then what if I get there and I can't find, it's like, man, does anyone take any risks anymore, like, at all? Like, people are just so risk adverse, I think it's because of the media, uh, they like to put fear and fear and fear constantly into people. Uh, life isn't all that super dangerous. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I would say that to most, for most people, they just don't take enough risks. Right, absolutely. So obviously with like a lot of these endeavors, there is there is great risk, whether we're talking about entrepreneurship or sailing or rapping. And I guess what you're saying, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is that 
part of it is having the right attitude first, having an attitude that is adaptive, right? So you don't, it's not always like, well, if I fail, how am I going to recover? Or how do I deal with these setbacks? And I think maybe, you know, there are times where it is important to, you know, have a plan for doing that. But having the right attitude first is like, okay, well, if suddenly I'm being pulled out of the ocean or if, uh, you know, a business fails or some other kind of venture doesn't work out, uh, what's the opportunity in that? Yeah, it's uh, people uh, today, there's so much opportunity and uh, so much less risk. Like the world's never really been safer in terms of your actual ability to live. Uh, you just look at this Ebola thing right now and I don't know what's going on and I, I doubt it's it's as dire as grave as they say it is just like swine flu and bird flu and every other one they've had for decades but um, you just see like even that uh, oh a few people in Africa are dying well let's shut down the whole world to make sure no one ever dies from it like the, the, the world's gone so extreme to making sure are trying to make sure you can't stop nature uh, to to make sure that no one ever dies um, or no one ever gets hurt um, and people have really gotten warped by that to thinking that you know the most important thing is safety that's what you hear so much now safety 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 oh you can't even ride a bicycle without a helmet and shin guards and knee guards what if you scraped your knee well when I was a kid you know I hate I'm I know I'm sounding like an old person now uh, because I that's what old people say is when I was a kid uh, but I remember just you know wiping myself out on my bike I had like no skin on either of my hands Hands or half of my face after one crash, I learned from that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot to be said for um, uh, not being too safe. Uh, to me, the whole world today is, is skewed way too much towards safety. Um, and not to say that you shouldn't take precautions, uh, and not to say that you shouldn't evaluate risks and rewards. But I think it's far too skewed to safety right now. I, I just hear it so much, and it sounds so. A little bit pathetic to me just how people are talking like um, if you think about people who went to the US from almost anywhere in the world like a hundred years ago sure immigrants yeah yeah immigrants right to Ellis Island and a uh, hundred years ago the average person showed up usually without shoes uh, they didn't really know where they're going there was no internet to check it out they just heard that there was this place where there might be an opportunity to get ahead uh, the average person showed up to Ellis Island uh, with $90 in today's dollars uh, in their pocket, uh, so enough to live for a couple days, uh, and uh, they survived. And you look at people like during the Vietnam War when, the, again, the U.S. Empire created a false flag attack in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, to go and attack and kill millions of people over in Asia. A lot of them wanted to get out of there, and a lot of them, for whatever reason, wanted to go to the U.S. They'd go in like container ships uh, across the ocean. Uh, most of them would die along the way or eat each other along the way. Once they got to the U.S., uh, they didn't know anyone. They didn't speak the language at all. Uh, they didn't have any money. And pretty quickly, they had the little Vietnamese restaurant. They made a life for themselves. Um, and now today, you have kids who have parents and, uh, you know, who have lines of credit and who have money and who can give them a few thousand dollars if they need it. And, uh, for example, what I say to a lot of people today, is, especially in the U.S., uh, who, ha who are parents who have kids, I say don't save up for your kid's college. Save up if you want. And then when they're old enough, and that might not be 18, that could be 14 or 15 or 16. These age ar arbitrary limits are ridiculous. Uh, the U.S. has the... Uh, oldest children in the world today <laughs> they're really the after people get out of college uh, they're like 25 and they still have never worked a job and they don't know how to do anything they're, it's ridiculous uh, but what I say to parents is to uh, uh, save up and buy their kid you know if their kid is wants to it don't ever force your children to do anything but if they want to uh, save up for a around the world ticket uh, for them when at whatever age that they're ready and uh, and tell them go out there and find a business opportunity somewhere in the world there's nothing but opportunity out there if if that's what the kid wants now if the kid wants to be a scientist and he wants to uh, do certain things where you need a certain degree that's fine go ahead and do that but if the kid doesn't want to do that uh, there's much more opportunity in traveling the world and, and uh, taking a few what people call risks. I, I call it risky to go to college in the U.S. today with all the debt you're going to go into. Sure. Uh, very minimal job prospects for most of the things that you're going to learn in those colleges. I think that's incredibly risky uh, behavior. Well, yeah, absolutely. First of all, as far as the safety thing is concerned, I, I said in a show not too long ago that 
the two highest values in Western society today seem to be safety and fairness. And if I remember correctly, those were the two highest values in my elementary school. So, yeah, I guess if you can say one positive thing about school, it does prepare us for uh, uh, citizenship. But as far as the as far as the college versus travel thing, you know, this is one thing that uh, this criticism that was always leveled at me when I would talk to people about basically the philosophy of liberty. And, you know, I would be critical of things that were, were, were happening in the U.S., really with the U.S. government, because people have a hard time separating, you know, the physical country or society of the United States from the government. It's all just one thing to most people. So mm -hmm. criticizing the government is, you know, you hate America. I mean, that's that's real. That happens. But one of, one of the things people would say to me is like, oh, you just need to get out and travel more. You, you need to see more of the world because then, Jeff, they said to me, then you would appreciate living in the United States. But maybe starting with your, uh, you know, uh, sailing to El Salvador, you have gone on from there. You picked up a backpack. You went to like 100 <laughs> countries. Uh, you found that's not the truth. The truth. You don't, uh, you wouldn't have a greater appreciation for the U.S. after that kind of experience. It's all perspective. Uh, I've heard that a million times, of course. And um, here's, here's what's going on. Those people who are telling you that, they really like how the U.S. is very structured. They like that there's cops on every corner. They like that if someone doesn't stop at a stoplight that, that they get accosted and they get extorted for money. Uh, they like that because they see that as order and civilization, uh, which is fine if that's what they like, uh, but they're forcing it on other people through the political system. Uh, but if that's what they like, that's fine. Uh, but what happens is a lot of those sort of people who really like that, they just think that's the right way that life should be. They'll go to a, a, any other place almost outside of the Western world and they'll get very scared. They'll be like, well, people here can drive whatever speed they want. Uh, that's very scary to me. It's so funny for me here in Mexico. Uh, we have a small hotel here uh, in Acapulco. And so I've, I've met a lot of American clients who come down and, and some of them are just so scared. They're like, well, what's the speed limit here? I'm like, well, there really isn't. Just don't hit anybody. And they're like, oh my God. Uh, you know, like there's no one to tell us to slow down. It's like no, you just use your common sense and and um, uh, things like that. And even right now, actually, all the traffic police have been on strike for the last few months, and actually, the traffic's been running great uh, because uh, uh, people are just not really uh, stopping at a stoplight if there's no oncoming traffic. They'll just uh, you know treat it as a, a caution and just make sure there's no traffic coming, and then just keep going. And the traffic's been a lot better. And actually, the traffic police want to come back now, and no one wants them to come back. Um, but so it's all perspective because a lot of these people who say these things, they're like, well, if I go to Paraguay, uh, there is no uh, health insurance, uh, you know, f from the government, uh, you know, or, or things like that. And it's like, well, just buy your own. Um, you know, these international health insurance is about $600 a year or something. It's very cheap. Um, a lot of the people who say they don't like these other places are mostly coming from a uh, a, a sort of a, a state of mind uh, that they like all this massive structure that is in the U.S., which is now actually destroying the U.S., and they don't even realize it. Uh, all the regulations, for example, they'll go to Thailand and will say, well, I just bought street noodles at the street cart run by some guy who's checking to make sure it's clean. It's like, well, that guy is, because if he ever serves you something bad and you get sick, he's out, he loses his business. No one will ever eat there again. So uh, they just don't understand freedom. It's funny because you're trying to explain freedom to Americans, uh, which is very hard to do. <laughs> they just seem to have no concept about it anymore whatsoever. Uh, they have no faith in the, in, the, in the free market, and they think government needs to regulate everything. For the most part, even, even your average conservative who used to be more of the free market sort of side of things, they've become very, very statist. Uh, they, they think there's regulations needed for the most part, or at least somewhat. Um, they think that uh, you need this massive military defense system or else people are going to attack us, which is completely impossible in the U.S. with uh, 300 million guns in the U.S. as the Japanese emperor who had just uh, been cut off from oil supply during World War II, which caused the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, said uh, no country would ever attack the U.S. There'd be a rifle behind every blade of grass, and it's totally correct. Uh, the largest army on earth is actually American hunters uh, during hunting season. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the people who say these things are coming from a very skewed thing, and they're, they're very scared of, of different cultures as well. 
a lot of the time, those sort of people, they'll go to a place like, say, Mexico, which is totally not scary whatsoever. I think it's way scarier to go to the U.S. with all the police and, and, uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, they'll come down, they'll stay in like one of these uh, all-inclusive gated hotels, and they won't even go out. And, and they're just very scared. And it's funny because, again, U.S., um, many Americans will say, oh, this is the land of the brave, home of the, or home of the brave, land of the free, or whatever it is. Uh, it's totally ridiculous because it's one of the least free countries on earth in the, at this moment in time in almost every metric. Uh, it's, and it's, uh, no one there is brave. Uh, they're so scared. And not no one. There's obviously, I hate to generalize, there is a lot of Americans who aren't scared and who do, I see them traveling around all the time. But uh, the majority of Americans in general are just fearful of everything, including things like Ebola. I, I, I just watch the news and I'm just like, okay, what are they going to scare Americans with this week? And it's been Ebola this week. Then it was ISIS. So oh, now it's ISIS, uh, John McCain's uh, gang of thugs that he uh, used to hang out with a year ago in arm. Now they are going to destroy us all. And then people kind of didn't really believe that for a little while. And then they said, now it's Corazon. It's 50 guys. They can put a bomb in toothpaste and they can light their clothes on fire and blow up things. Uh, so therefore, we need to, to take over the entire Middle East and create a police state in the U.S. Um, because a few YouTube videos of so, uh, that look totally fake, and actually the media said probably was fake, uh, of beheadings uh, was, uh, you know, it's crazy. Uh, everything about the U.S. is crazy, and that's why I like to be outside of it. And I, I like to make sure I don't watch the U.S. news uh, at all because it gets your heart racing, it gets you feeling fearful. And as soon as you turn it off, it's like, oh, everything's fine. Look, birds <laughs> that's so, yeah, that's really true. <laughs> you know, your story it reminds me of this the ongoing argument that I had with a girl I was dating uh, like seven, eight years ago. And we had some money and we were trying to plan a vacation. And she wanted to go to Sandals Resort in Cancun. And I said, listen, dangerous. being around a bunch of people <laughs> from Long Island complaining about the humidity is not my idea of a vacation. I want to go someplace. I want to actually have a vacation. I want to, you know, a vacation from this culture. Um, but she was like, well, you want to just go and wander around in Mexico? <laughs> like, we'll, we'll get beheaded. Uh, and, and that is really like, I, I, we're going to get into this in a few minutes, but, you know, I started talking about this exploration I've been doing of moving to Mexico for a while. And uh, yeah, I mentioned it to my father. I was just at a family thing. And he's like, well, gosh, that sounds dangerous. You know, so I think that um, uh, perspective is part of it in a lot of ways. But when it comes to because this is a series about greater financial independence, uh, when it comes to things like entrepreneurship, it's really not that subjective. Like there are I heard you say this and I thought it was really inspirational. Like there are so many opportunities elsewhere in the world. You can make things happen so fast outside of the United States. If you have an idea, if you have a vision and a little bit of capital, or in some cases none, you can make things happen elsewhere. 